Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Now chapter seven. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked Queen, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. This is God's word. Oh, after the S sewing, but anyway. 
Well, it's a privilege to uh, open uh, up God's Word again. It's been a while since we've been in Esther, so uh, it was good to have the recap. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, just before we uh, jump in, as we always seek to do, let's ask the Lord for his blessing on this time. Our Father, we come to you and uh, this is your day, the Lord's day, where the victory was secured, Christ raised from the dead, and we are gathered because of that great victory and we share in the spoils because of what he achieved. And so, Lord, this, this service is thanksgiving and an outpouring of praise to you. We've come to worship you. Lord, we've offered up prayers We've sung the word of God un, uh, unto you and praises to you. And now, Lord God, we come to sit at your feet to hear your word, to hear the words of the living God. And, Lord, we join the boy Samuel upon hearing your voice who said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so, Lord, we come and we ask that you would just prepare our hearts to receive your word. We thank you for this time. We ask for the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit, for his guidance, for his power. And Lord, that you would bring about change, encouragement and growth in our lives so that we may be the bride that Christ came to purchase. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. I came across a uh, report uh, an article of a celebrated animal hunter. His name is Ian Hunter, uh, so he lived up to his name. And on one of his outings and exposition, uh, expeditions, he spotted a baby elephant. And being presumptuous and willing to do that, which is illegal, he went up to the baby elephant and started to measure out its tusks so that he could harvest them. The baby elephant was obviously distressed as it was grabbed by the tusk. It started kicking in a rage and it trampled the hunter to death. Now, as I went down, I scrolled down in the article and there was a comment uh, by a man named Matt Buckland. And he wrote and he wanted to chime in on a recent incident that happened to him. And he said that he, he works as a recruiter and one day he was on the train and this guy came past him, shoved him out of the way, was incredibly rude, started swearing at him to get lost and took off down the carriage. Anyway, Matt uh, tried to compose himself, obviously taken back and angered by what had happened to him. Matt makes his way, gets off the train, makes his way to his office. Long behold, he sees sitting outside of his office this same man waiting for an interview. And he was licking his lips. Now, what would the world call those kind of incidents? What would they call it? Well, it was spread out all over the article. What came up time and time again was karma, karma, karma. Karma served. Karma comes from the, as we know, the Indian religious philosophy and it could be translated as what goes around comes around. It is the universal principle of giving people what they deserve. But when we think about the idea of karma, the actual notion of it and what it is is actually an affront and an assault on God. It is a term that has been hijacked, the biblical principle really that has been hijacked from God, given a new name and given a new origin. But it's nothing more than a repackaged biblical truth and a principle that God operates. Let me read to you Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. It says, The one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Not just a New Testament principle either. Job chapter 4, verse 8. As I've seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. What's the biblical principle? Sowing and reaping. 
Now, tonight, sowing and reaping is the theme of our passage. This is exactly what we see here. It was helpful with the recap. We've seen Haman has been shamed when Mordecai was honoured publicly. And then his wife prophesied about his upcoming downfall. So he's feeling overwhelmed. But last time we were in, we saw that this, that particular passage, it ended with, as all of this was happening, Haman is hurried away. There's no time for him to process everything that's unfolding. The, the servants hurry him away to the second banquet. There's no time to reflect. And so we arrive here at uh, chapter 7 and... Haman has arrived at the banquet. So tonight, I uh, just want to divide our uh, text into two points, really, two, two sections. Firstly, we see Esther stands up. Esther stands up. Look at verses 1 to 2. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, and as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be granted. Now, us as the readers, we know that Esther has been planning behind the scenes. Uh, there's been a lot of planning going into this banquet, but the king and, and Haman, they have got no idea about the bomb that is about to be let off in front of them. They've got no idea what's coming to them and what they're about to hear. And so we can imagine as much planning has gone into this banquet, Esther must be feeling quite nervous quite anxious. They, they've just eaten and now they're getting into the drinking of the wine and she's probably wondering if the king is going to remember that, hey, all these banquets weren't just for no reason. I had a request and I have a petition for, for you. And so she may be wondering, is the king going to bring it up? Well, we've seen throughout this book, God has been lining up every single detail in the story. And he is not about to let the king forget that Esther has a request. And so he says, what's your petition? What is your request? Even up to the half of the kingdom, I'll give to you. And this is the third time he's asked her. He asked her when she entered illegally into his court, when she approached him, and he asked her, then he asked her the night before at the first banquet, now the third time, what is your request? And Esther has been incredibly self-controlled. The anxiety and the worry and the fear that she must be feeling, she wanted, probably would have on the first occasion wanted to just blurt out everything that was happening. But wisdom overcame the flesh. She's patient, she's temperate, and she seeks the opportune moment. And so the king asks her, now I want you to consider just and comprehend how difficult and how delicate her mission is at this point, especially delicate. So her mission, what she has to do is she has to try and expose Haman before the king, knowing that he's the king's best friend. So she has to portray Haman as incredibly wicked and vile, at the same time, she needs to be so careful not to make the king feel like he is guilty in what has happened, because after all, he was the one that approved of the decree. So she needs to try and make sure that he doesn't feel foolish or stupid for participating in this. This is incredibly difficult. Now, just to give you a bit of context, into the kind of man, again, that King Xerxes is and who Esther is approaching. We have an ancient historian who records an event that happened in Xerxes' life, telling us what kind of man he was. There was a man named Pythias, and he came to King Xerxes with a request, just like Esther has a request. And Pythias came with this request, asking that his firstborn son be excused from the war that was going to take place, the king's war. Now, Pythias had a very good relationship with Xerxes, very good relationship. The king had even on one occasion dined at Pythias' house. On top of that, Pythias had been very generous financially in contributing to the costs of this war. So there's a good relationship here. They're friends. And so he makes this request. How does King Xerxes respond to this request? He is so indignant. 
He is so outraged, he orders that Pythias' son is cut into pieces and the whole army is made to walk through the sun, the pieces of the sun. That is the kind of man that Esther is approaching with a request and a request that the king has foolishly brought about on himself. So she needs to expose the king's best friend as wickedly vile. And she needs to be so delicate not to make the king feel like he's a fool for signing the decree. This is mission impossible. This is an outrageous task. The odds are completely against her. What you're witnessing is the same old thing we see in the scriptures. This is Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, hoping to survive. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the furnace, hoping to survive. This is David, the boy, standing against Goliath. This is Israel standing in front of the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind them. This is Israel trying to break into the impenetrable walls of Jericho. And this is the disciples who were told to feed more than 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. This is impossible, what she is facing. But what do all those people have in common? Every single one of them, what did they have? God was with them. God was with them. That changes absolutely everything. And Christian, I have no idea what some of you are facing. I don't know some of the trials you're going through. And you don't know some of the trials I'm going through. But here's what I want you to understand. The same God is with you. The God of David and Daniel. The God of Esther. The God of Israel watches over you. And he watches over me. Esther here has to face one of the greatest trials of her life. One of the greatest. And she has to face it head on. And friends, we aren't excluded from such trials. We're not. But what does Esther do? She faces it and she stands up. She stands up. Look at verse 3. Then Queen Esther answered, If I've found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. Now how different, this has been a few days in the, in the making, how different are these requests to what the king was expecting? What's he expecting? Well, maybe she's come and, and she wants some more privileges, or she wants that be in charge of of more things. Or maybe she wants an upgrade in her part of the palace. Or maybe she wants her friends to get a promotion. Esther wants none of that. She comes saying, Oh, king, my husband, I want to live. And I want my people to live. Now, the opening of her request reveals another complex dilemma and dimension of how difficult her task is. Think about it. She says, I am I and my people. And and the reader is forced here. We should want to question Esther and say, Excuse me, Esther, who who exactly are your people? Who? Because what have we seen? The past five years, she has kept her identity as a Jew, as one who belongs to Yahweh. She's kept it completely secret. She's kept it secret from the king, her husband. She's kept it secret from second in charge, Haman. She's kept it secret from the palace. Everyone knows that Mordecai is a Jew. Haman does. And yet no one knows that Esther and Mordecai are cousins. And that she belongs to this people. Let me quote one writer who brings this out really well. He says, quote, To hide her nationality that successfully while living among pagans, she must have broken virtually every law in the book of Moses. She certainly couldn't have observed the laws of ritual cleanness or of kosher food or of special times and seasons of Thanksgiving like Passover. End of fasting. She couldn't have even prayed to God publicly. She had blended in completely with the pagan colors of the empire. End quote. 
She was so compromised in her faith the last five years. And yet through this incredible trial, through the divinely orchestrated events, God has shaken her to the core and she must decide who she belongs to. So before we saw, she said to Mordecai, I can't go and speak to the king about this. I'm going to die. And now she says, I and my people want to live. She identifies with them at the risk of her life. She identifies. She stands. Esther is standing. We have been privileged to be able to walk through this book chapter by chapter and get front row seats to this incredible transformation that's happened before our eyes. She stands. Esther doesn't cower anymore, so she will either live with her people or she will die with her people. She is one with them and she will share in their fate for better or for worse. It's a glorious transformation It's amazing. She's no longer the woman, just another wife in the harem who's camouflaging. She's no longer keeping her identity secret so she can just enjoy her pretty golden palace and a comfortable life. No, she's standing up as queen of the empire. She is standing up because God has raised her up. She's standing. And now notice how she words the rest of the whole request here. Look at verse 4. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we'd merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Now, that is strong language from so beautiful and elegant elegant a queen. I and my people have been sold and for destruction, to be slaughtered, to be annihilated, to be wiped out as a race, as it were. We've been sold. How were they sold? How were the Jews sold? Well, back in chapter 3, when Haman wanted to convince the king to kill this people, Haman, Haman does that, but then he realizes this, isn't, this is kind of going to be counterproductive for the king because if he wipes out all these people, they're taxpayers, They fund the palace. They fund the expeditions. Every government needs its taxpayers. And and, and he's just going to sign off on killing them all. Haman knows that. So what does he do? In verse 9, he says, And king, I myself will put 10,000 talents into the royal treasury. I'll make up for the loss. That's no small sum of money, by the way. That is 340 tons of silver. I'll fund it all. And so Esther says, we have been sold to the slaughterhouse, my people. And by the way, king, me included. Me included. I'm in on this. Now brace yourself for the king's response. Look at verse 5. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? He's furious. He's exploding with anger here. Why? Because this plot is against the queen, and she is the king's queen. If you're assaulting the queen, if you threaten the queen, you're laying out your hand on the throne. You're assaulting the king himself, and he is furious. Look at the language. Who is he? Where is he? He's furious. Tell me. Proverbs 20 verse 2 says, the, the terror of the king is like the roaring of a lion. Now, we cannot afford now to miss the wisdom in which Esther has spoken. It's incredible. She's just informed the king of a maniacal plot of genocidal proportions, which included the unthinkable of killing the queen as well. But Esther... After saying all that, she still leaves out the identity of Satan's man, of this wicked foe. She leaves out the identity at this point. Why does she do that? Why does she leave out the man's name? She knows that the king is close to Haman. 
And she knows the first thing that needs to happen, she wants to first arouse the king's anger, that, that uncontrollable anger first, to arouse his anger. And only once he is angry at the situation, then reveal the target. Now, this is incredible biblical wisdom. This isn't the only time we see it in Scripture. You remember when, when Nathan the prophet confronted King David. Now, now, David slept, as we know, with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and then he organized the murder of the husband, Uriah. But somehow, in some way, David managed to quieten his conscience through this sin, and then Nathan comes to confront him, but Nathan doesn't come up to him saying, I know what you did, you wretched king. Nathan doesn't do that. What does he do? He tells him a parable. And a parable that is so shocking that it's going to arouse an emotional response. Let me just read to you again this parable. 2 Samuel 12, 1. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it as a meal for the traveler who had come to him. End of the parable. Now, why do I bring this up? How does Israel's king respond to this? He responds exactly the same as Persia's king. He is furious. What does it say? And David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. Can I paraphrase it? In other words, who is he and where is he? It's exactly the same as the book of Esther. Exactly the same. Esther uses this same wisdom to arouse the anger of this king before revealing the perpetrator. There's so much wisdom here. And the biblical author is trying to show us this is divine. This is not natural wisdom. What is the biblical author trying to do here? What's he trying to communicate? He's spoiling the end of the story for us. He's spoiling it. He's saying, do you remember what Mordecai said? Mordecai was prophesying, she has been raised for such a time as this. She is clothed with wisdom from on high. She's speaking with the wisdom of God. And she will succeed. Because God has raised her for such a time as this. Yes, the biblical author is saying, yes, the Jewish orphan girl became queen. Yes, she will stand up against the king. Yes, the Jews will be saved. Yes, the Messiah will come. And friends, yes, you and I will be saved because that Messiah will be born. He will live and he will die and be crucified for your sin and for my sin. Don't you want to worship him? Don't you want to? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he glorious? He is the great saviour. He is the true and great saviour. And some of you, oh, that God would bring you to him tonight, to meet with him. He is the true king. Esther would have been terrified confronting King Xerxes, absolutely terrified. She couldn't reason with him regarding morals because he was an immoral man. He was bloodthirsty. He was power hungry. She would have been fearful. It took courage to stand up to such a king. Can I make something clear? It does not take courage to come to King Jesus. 
Let me say it again. It does not take courage to come to King Jesus. What does it take? It takes humility. It takes a broken, repentant, and contrite spirit. And it takes a believing heart, a heart that comes to him, believing all that he has said about himself and believing all that he has done. He's altogether different, this king. He's wonderful. Do you know him? Do you know him? It's hard for sinners to come. It's hard for sinners to come because we're proud and unbelieving. It's impossible, right? I'm living proof of it. And Christian, so are you. Well, now the king is rightly indignant, so Esther can reveal the man's name. And now she pulls back the curtain, the shocking surprise, the shocking truth. Look at verse 6. Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Again, such strong language from a beautiful and elegant, elegant queen. The one who did the unthinkable was none other than the king's right-hand man. The one who enjoyed so much favor, so many blessings from the king. The betrayer and foe was the one sitting across the table from the king. Does that remind you of anyone? Who was one of Jesus' right-hand men? Who was one who, who received untold blessings and favor from Jesus? Who was the secret enemy and the betrayer that sat across Jesus from the table? It's Judas. And the same thing is here. Well, this is our first point tonight. Esther stands up. Esther stands up. Secondly and lastly, tonight, we see Haman falls down. Haman falls down. Verse 6, just the middle there. And Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Now, this is a massive, significant shift in Haman now that we're seeing. How he is portrayed. Yes, he was ashamed before. Yes, he was feeling uneasy about what his wife says. But he moves now from shame to uneasiness. Now he moves to terror. He is terrified. Now, why does Haman think that he's at the banquet? What have we seen? Why does he think he's there? He is the only one in the kingdom who's been invited to the table of the king and the queen. He thinks he's there because he's loved more than anyone. He thinks he's there because he is the favorite. He's basically thinking, I'm part of the throne. I'm sitting with the king and queen. It's like some kind of perverse trinity, the king, the queen, and Haman. This is, why, this is what's going through his mind. And yet, now he finds out that he's been invited to this banquet for something completely different. Completely different. He's been invited to be exposed for his sins to finally catch up with him and to come out into the light. Now, truth be told, Haman didn't know. We see from the book of Esther, Haman didn't know that Esther was a Jew. He did not know. And so he didn't mean to include Esther in his plan of genocide. He didn't. But what do we see through this? What do we see? The biblical principles. What a man sows, that he will reap. What a man sows, that he will reap. Proverbs 6.27 is so fitting of Haman. It says this, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Haman sowed fire, and now he's feeling the heat. He's feeling the heat, and he's terrified here. Look at verse 7. The king got up in a rage and left his wine and went into the palace garden. Now, the king is so furious. It's boiling up so much. He's got to leave the room before he destroys everything. Now, why does the king leave the room? What is the main reason for his exit here? Now, it's interesting. You you read many people and and people think, you know, it's because he's so, so furious 
And he's so angry at Haman, he's got to get out of there, and he start, he's running through his mind, okay, which form of execution is going to bring me the most pleasure with Haman? That's how angry he is. That's what people speculate. But I don't think it's any of those reasons. I don't think it's because of that. I think that he is perplexed, and he is racking his brain at this point. Think about it. He's the one who approved of this plan. He's the one who signed off. He's the one who's at fault here. This only happened under his watch. It was stamped with his ring. He was manipulated. He was deceived. Haman played him. So yes, the king is angry at Haman, but he is just as angry at himself for being fooled. And so he leaves in a rage, working out, how do I deal with this? Because it's got my name all over it. Well, it leaves now just Esther and Haman together at the table, just the two of them. Look at verse 7. The king went out into the palace garden, but Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Now, Haman knows the king well enough to know that he's now toast. He's seen what happens to people who make this king angry. He knows the outcome. He knows the end of the story here. So he doesn't rush off out of the room to go and plead with his best friend. Doesn't do that. He seeks a mediator in someone else. He seeks a mediator in Esther. Now we have marveled. We have marveled at Esther's transformation. But what about Haman's transformation that's been unfolding before our eyes? Him who was merciless, begging for mercy. He who signs off on mass genocide, begging for his own life. He who sought to wipe out the Jewish race out of hatred is now kneeling and begging before a Jew. What a change, what a transformation. And now the pieces are aligning in Haman's mind. That very day his wife prophesied that you're going to fall. You are going to fall because these people are the Jews. Mordecai is a Jew. And in the same night, it's being fulfilled. So what is Haman doing here? What, as we look at this verse, verse 8, what is Haman doing? He's repenting. He's repenting before Esther. What's he doing? He's not asking for justice. He's begging for mercy. He's not pleading his good works. He's pleading for mercy. He's not pleading his innocence. He's asking for forgiveness. He's seeking it. But what do we see? It is forgiveness. It is repentance, sorry. Repentance too late. Repentance too late. This should have happened back in chapter 6 when his wife prophesied against him, saying, you're going to come to ruin. It should have happened then. When should he have repented? If not then, on the way to the banquet. If not then, when they sat down at the table. If not then, before he started feasting on all that sumptuous food. If not then, before Esther opened her mouth. But it's repentance too late. It's too late. He's missed the hour of mercy because the sentence has already been pronounced in the king's heart. Does this remind you of anyone again? Does it remind you of anyone the one who sat at the table with Jesus, the one who betrayed Jesus, who plotted to betray innocent blood, who ended up going through with it. What happened to him? What happened to that man? He got 30 silver coins, but he went back to the religious leaders. And he went to them in the middle of the night and he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Take the money back. I want out. And they said, we don't want your money. And so he throws the money on the ground. But it's too late. The Son of Man has been betrayed. Prophecy has been fulfilled. And Judas walks a green mile and he's hung. It's repentance too late. That famous playwright Oscar Wilde said this quote, no man is rich enough to buy back his past. Repentance too late. Now, while all this is happening at the table, the king's still in the garden. 
still in the palace garden, trying to rack his brain, figuring out, what do I do with Haman in this mess? Well, Haman's going to solve the problem for the king. He's going to solve it. Look at verse 8. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? Haman's begging is so desperate before Esther. He's now at her feet. He's grabbing onto her legs. He's tugging at her garments. This is a desperate man who knows he's on death row. Now, is Haman trying to molest the queen while the king is out of the room for a moment? Absolutely not. Is Haman, though, touching her in a way that men shouldn't touch a queen? Yes, absolutely. But now Haman, all reason, has gone out the window because he's terrified. But God's principle stands. What a man sows, that he will reap. He has showed no mercy and he will receive no mercy now. So even this innocent action of begging for his life, it is used and deemed as scandalous. He's treated as a criminal for begging for his life. The king pounces as a lion. Look at verses 8 to the end of the passage. The second half there, as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 23 meters high stands by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. A lot can happen in 24 hours. But notice here, again, the word of God, how sharp it is. The biblical author doesn't want to just tell us that Haman died. He was killed. Doesn't, that's, that's not what the biblical author is interested in. The biblical author wants us to know how did Haman die? How did he die? Did you see the sowing and reaping language used by the author by the Holy Spirit? Gallows 23 meters high at Haman's house, which he built for Mordecai. And if you didn't get it the first time, he repeats himself. Look again at the end. So they hanged him on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. Do you see what the Spirit's doing here? What he's showing? What a man sows, he will reap. So we've seen here, Haman, through the book of Esther, he's been characterized by pride. He wants glory. He wants acclaim. He wants people to bow to him. He wants them to praise his name. He wants to wear the king's clothes. He wants to ride on the king's horse. He wants to be higher than everyone. Guess what? Now he is 75 foot higher than everyone in the city. God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked, sowing and reaping. And this, friends, this is right throughout the Bible. I'm not trying to stretch the text here. David slept with another man's wife. What happened? David's own son slept with his servants. Samson decided to make decisions based on the lust of his eyes and not the call of God, and he had his eyes gouged out. Jacob deceived his father, pretending to be Esau. And what happened down the track? His uncle deceived him into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. Friends, this is how God works. This is how God operates. This is how he deals with sin. And so Haman comes to his end. We would do well to heed the words of Psalm chapter 7, verses 15 to 16. Everyone in this room. He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. His violence comes down on his own head. Be careful. Be careful of what he's done in the dark. So let me close. As we wrap up here, two things to reflect on as we take away from this passage. Haman is a living representative here of fallen sinful humanity. He is a living representative. He's proud. His confidence is in wealth, status, power, respectability. 
He gave up his life pursuing everything that the empire could offer him. That's what he did. And yet, how quickly did his life's pursuit come to an end? He goes from the banquet to the gallows in a matter of moments. That's, that's frightening that some can fall that fast. And this is the same hook, line, and bank and bait that the world puts before all of us. This is what people do. Pursue, pursue, pursue everything that the empire has to offer. Success, power, respect from your peers, more possessions, bigger and newer things, more and more. And yet, never satisfied, never attaining satisfaction, But what happens? The pursuit doesn't end. It doesn't end. What eventually happens? Tragedy strikes. An illness. The breaking down of a relationship. A tragedy. You go from the banquet to the gallows in a matter of moments. The best this world has to offer, it will wear out and come to an end. So I challenge you, some of you especially, why so into ground that only bears thorns. Why? Why invest in a ship that God says will sink? Would you, have, would you have bought tickets to the Titanic if you knew that it was going down? And yet we do the same in this life. We do exactly the same. Friends, why live for what is temporal? Why? Last reflection. Esther has gotten rid of Haman. He's gone, he's out of the picture, but her mission is still incomplete. The king at this point hasn't agreed to overthrow the decree and save her people. The decree at this point still stands. And so we have to ask the question, will God come through for Israel? Will he? Will he rescue them? Now, think about the principle. If you sow evil, you will reap evil. If you sow righteousness, you will reap righteousness. What's the problem here? Israel has sown unrighteousness. What's the problem here? We have seen even Mordecai has sown unrighteousness. He didn't go back to Israel, to the temple, with his people, to the promised land. He stayed in the comfortable empire. What's the problem? We've seen that Esther has been sowing unrighteousness for the last five years. So how can God come through for this people if they have sown unrighteousness? Because do not we reap what we sow, after all? Isn't that not what we've seen? If God is to rescue the people, it must be dependent upon something other than their faithfulness. It must be dependent upon his faithfulness. That's the only option. If they are to be saved, the faithfulness of God who promised to love Israel, to keep Israel, to make them his special possession, one who would never break his covenant with them. And friends, it is exactly the same for us. What did we sing in that wonderful song before? For our love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Esther would do well to sing that song. What else did it say in that song? He'll not let my soul be lost. Why? I've sown unrighteousness. Why won't he let my soul be lost? What does it say? His promises shall last. It's not dependent upon their faithfulness. It's dependent upon his promises. What's the promise that you and I have? He who did not spare his only son, but delivered him up for us all. And we take refuge in that. So again, I ask you, do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Do you follow him? Some of you, it's time to stand up. For so many years, you've kept it secret and you've dishonored him. It's time to stand up. And for others of you who are faithful, don't be terrified before your king. He says, come to my throne with boldness. Come to the throne of grace and come as often as you want. You're welcome there and you will find mercy and grace in your time of need. Let me pray.
Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness that is on display. Each of us have sown so much unrighteousness. And if it were not for you to change that seed that we had sown, we would all be perishing right now. Some of us would be in hell and some of us would be heading there very soon. But you rescued us, God. You made great and precious promises to us. We thank you for sending your son. We have no hope apart from him. But now we've come to love him because he first loved us. We praise you for the greatness of your sacrifice. Lord, we confess even this week, even this month, our love is going to grow cold at points. And so we say, oh God, you must hold us fast. We rely on your promises. That's all that we have. That's all that we rely on. Lord, we thank you for our time in your word. May you bless it to each heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.